morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the sponsorship changes and uh, guidelines to how to complete a sponsorship application or how to provide support to someone doing a sponsorship application. Uh, my name is Edgar Padrama Medina. I work here as a refugee and immigration uh, protection uh, manager here at the FCJ Refugee Center. Uh, the information provided today is it could, could have not been done without the support of the Law Foundation of, uh, of Ontario and all the support they, they bring to us as an organization. Uh, very briefly, um, our agenda today is what is a sponsorship? Um, our main concerns as well, especially because of the nature of sponsorship and the power dynamics of sponsorships are what happens when there's a sponsorship breakdown and how to prevent and how to deal with uh, domestic violence and intrafamilial violence in sponsorships of spouses and, uh, and uh, dependents as well. A brief section about this as well, uh, about our organization is that we've been working for almost 30 years, shoulder to shoulder with uh, refugee claimants, precarious migrants and people without status. And um, we've been offering a very varied amount of um, support ranging from the immigration protection area where I work to uh, the settlement area where we offer uh, access to shelter, housing, uh, food security, access to medical, um, access to healthcare, um, and also our anti-human trafficking league, and also our very robust um, youth group as well. So if anyone knows any family member who is who is categorized as a youth, uh, not only in spirit, um, please let us know and we'll get them connected as well. Um, ideally today, what we're going through is uh, how to go through a sponsorship application, uh, both online and on paper, and um, how to avoid mistakes and get everything uh, not done as quickly as possible, but as correctly as possible. So uh, you uh, future applications you provide support with or you complete yourselves, uh, don't, back, don't bounce back and forth uh, with Immigration Canada. Um, a colleague likes to say that uh, a sponsorship is like giving birth, it takes time, but once they get done, it feels incredible, but it takes a lot of work. So what is a sponsorship? Um, the idea is the, the sponsorship is an immigration program that allows families reunite in, in Canada or allow organizations and communities to help refugees, recognize refugees. Today's case, we'll be talking about uh, family unification. Um, if you have any questions about how to participate in a, in a refugee uh, sponsoring program, um, there's an amazing organization that I'll link to later on today, which is the Refugee uh, Sponsorship Training Program. That is a good stepping stone to see if you wanna provide support to anyone like say from Afghanistan who is recognized as a refugee abroad and you want to help them reunite with their family here. Um, the, also, the, the other purpose of this program is, um, it's also when it works out, sponsorships are amazing ways to help uh, new immigrants and refugees um, to, obtain status in Canada without uh, being totally or, or partially financially dependent on the Canadian government. So uh, in some situations like with Ukraine, if there's a natural situation of a sponsorship, it's excellent because it grants, it could grant access to a work permit application while it's being processed. So today we're gonna go over the, only the family class sponsorship, today's topic, but um. There are three types of sponsorships. Today's the family class, which only can be done in the following way. It can be your parents through a, a lottery system, so it's not entirely reliable. It can be your spouse or a common law partner, or it can be your dependents, which being dependents being anyone over under 22, under 22, and um, and who can be your children or adopted children. But please make note that it can't just be that you adopt your siblings' uh, um, children. It has to be children who are unaccompanied or who have been adopted to all legal standards of Canadian family law. So you can't unfortunately sponsor your siblings, cousins, cousins' children. It's a very direct line of a familial connection. There's also the private sponsorship of a group of five people, which if this is a case, uh, you may want to get in touch with the refugee training emergency sponsorship training program and government sponsorship where well, such was the case with Syria a couple of years ago. 
So what is family reunification? We can normally see this in two types of way. Um, it's a sort of spe a specific program that can be subdivided in two ways, through sponsorships or uh, refugee claimants who are doing permanent residence applications, who, look, who are looking to reunite with their family members who could not make the trip to Canada to add, to come to their uh, refugee claim. So when we talk about dependents, as we said before, our spouses by marriage or by common law, and both documents require their own sort of documents and evidence, and your biological or adopted children who were under 22 in the lock and dates. So when a lock and date, it varies from a program to program. So when if it's, if it's a refugee claim, a lock and date is when that refugee claim was originally filed. Originally filed. And in this case is when the private sponsorship, uh, the private sponsorship we're talking about today was submitted. Uh, in the case of, um, of paper applications, it's very important to keep track of when your packages arrive because if depending if your dependent is very close to turning 22, it's vital to have evidence to demonstrate that you submitted everything before they turn 22. If it's an online application, there'll be a submission date that is very clear to see, and that'll be evidence enough to prove that they were um, registered before the lock-in date. In the terms of the government-assisted refugee program, it's when the government officially received the case. Sorry, my computer is not that fast. Sorry, one second. I'm having a little bit of technical issues. Okay. So in order to be a sponsor you and sponsor your, your spouse or dependents, you have to either be at least 18 years old. You have to be a Canadian citizen or someone registered under the Canadian India, Indian Act or a permanent resident in, within Canada. Um, they can only sponsor their family members if you have proof that the people you are sponsoring are direct familial members, so spouse and direct dependents, and that you have the financial means uh, to support their family members during the sponsorship period. Uh, this a sponsorship application is basically an agreement which you are legally bound to provide financial support and to your family members as they go through the sponsorship period. So. Uh, there are a couple limitations about specifically when it comes to uh, permanent residents or Canadian citizens. So if you obtained your permanent residence um, by being sponsored by someone and then say things didn't work out and you want and you find someone else new in your life, um, you have to wait at least five years, not from the moment you submitted the uh, permanent uh, the sponsorship application, but the moment you receive your um, your permanent resident card. So say I initiated an application a year ago, I obtained my card today, and uh, and in the future, my relationship with my current sponsor doesn't work out. I have to wait five years from this date, so 2027 before I can sponsor someone. Um, the other issues that, um, that limit your access to being a, a sponsor is that you have to be residing in Canada. Um, you can't be you can't be a permanent resident subject to removal order. I know this sounds counterintuitive. That means someone who may have had their permanent residence but uh, may have done something to invalidate it. So maybe didn't reach the didn't meet the the res, res, uh, res, residential requirements in Canada, which is I think believe uh, no more than two years out of the five. Or if they're protected persons and they did apply for a permanent residence and they happen. To return to their country of origin, that is also that is also sort of invalidates their permanent residence, and you can't be someone with um, a criminal, a criminal, certain criminal records, and you can't be in jail or in prison. Um, and now back to who can get sponsored? So, very direct family members, so spouses, common law partners, or conjugal partners, 
your biological children, any dependent children, your spouse's children, and adopted children. And reminder, if you're adopting children, it's not enough to say that they were adopted in your country of origin. You have to have the legal paperwork here to demonstrate that they are adopted here as well. Um, your parents and grandparents can be sponsored as well, but please take into account that it's it's more of a lottery system that happens every year. So part of the sponsorship applications with parents and grandparents is getting lucky enough to be approved for that. And it also has high financial requirements. Um, you can apply for your brothers, sisters, nieces, and nephews, and grandchildren only if the following conditions are there. If they are or orphaned, under, 20, under 18, unmarried, and they have been legally adopted by you. So without that necessary conditions and the paperwork to demonstrate this, you can unfortunately cannot um, sponsor your, your brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews or grandchildren. And you can also uh, accompany, uh, sponsor accompanying relatives of your spouses, partners and dependent children. But that would also add especially when it comes to your dependent children having their own dependents or accompanying members, there may be additional financial requirements on your end. And uh, as the note says, if you meet the eligibility requirements, each sponsored person will have to provide their own documents, um, passports, their own forms, their own uh, biometric uh, information and their medical exams. So, who can't get sponsored? Um, you can't sponsor a spouse if the spouse you're sponsoring is under 18. Um, there are other conditions that um, that's really create a, a doubt about the legitimacy of marriage. Um, one example that we had recently is someone who recently arrived um, from another country. Uh, they met someone new here and the, there was a significant age gap um, they were international students. Uh, they come from diverse, really diverse backgrounds. Um, the sponsor here was on ODSP. And uh, the age discrepancy was just significant. So that, that application, despite the supporting evidence they had, it was immediately rejected by IRCC. And uh, the, the person who was rejected had to find another venue to try to regularize their status here in Canada. So be, uh, I understand that there, when you're working with people who want to get sponsored or if you're trying to submit your sponsorship as soon uh, for your own family members, there is an urge to get this done as soon as possible. But I, re I would like to remind people that the more time you take preparing a case and making sure that the application is complete and it doesn't create any doubts, the less likelihood it will be rejected and the more time you save. So please make sure to take the necessary time to gather all the necessary supporting facts and documents before you submit something. And again, you can't support, uh, sponsor your any siblings over 22 or any adult children over 22. Um, also, applicants, sponsor, sponsor people who have a criminal record can, may not be allowed to enter Canada. They may be found ineligible or inadmissible. And it creates it creates people it, it causes people to be stuck in a limbo. So if you're sponsoring someone who may have a criminal record back home, because um, the sponsorship will ask you for the criminal record, uh, you may want to either separate their application from other family members or take into serious account how that uh, criminal record can affect the sponsorship. Um, other issues that may cause issue. Uh, problems down the line is that there's a serious medical condition where the government of Canada may suspect that uh, the medical coverage here will sort of exceed a certain amount. Uh, I know Canada is a safe haven for a lot of people, but we must remind people that the immigration, despite public efforts, they are not, they are not here to take everyone in and they will do their best to try to reject certain uh, cases regardless of the medical conditions. So please be very careful. So uh, the application is sort of in two phases, even though you submit one package. Uh, the first part is submitting the application process where the sponsor gets approved to become a sponsor through their necessary documentation, providing uh, 
the evidence that there is a relationship either through familiar bound bounds or uh, um, your spouse through um, evidence of the key cohabitate or do you provide financial support to your to your sponsoree then the second portion of the application is that the person being sponsored will go through their own permanent resident application where they'll process their forms about their work history uh, family, uh, family information and they will ask them for their criminal background check and will be asked to do their biometrics and their medical exam so even though it's in two phases you send everything together okay um, there is a variation on uh, what forms are required based on what happens if your family member is abroad or here. And there's also one key difference. Um, if you're here with, if your sponsor person is here with a visitor visa, they can be a sponsor teacher in Canada and they can apply for a work permit. However, there's a key difference. Uh, there's a key risk with that uh, sponsorship of uh, asking for a permanent record if it's processed, processed within Canada. If an application that is processed within Canada, so i.e. someone with a visitor status who applies for a work permit is rejected, you can't appeal the decision. Uh, it's just final. So you may have to see if you find another venue for regularizing your status or send another application depending on how, how grave the rejection was. If you're applying from abroad, you can appeal. We normally suggest getting in touch with a lawyer to help you navigate that, to see what questions IRCC may have had about your sponsorship application and addressing them as soon as possible. Um, there have been some changes when it comes to like checklists and guides. Um, uh, as of 2018, um, they technically made it faster and they added a checklist with a basic guide uh, and document checklist and order in which documents must be submitted. Uh, in addition to that, uh, applicants will be asked to do their Schedule A background information form. This application, this form asks for uh, information about their academic history, their work history in the last 10 years, uh, if they participated in any government or uh, religious organization, and their addresses in the last 10 years. And they're also being asked to, ask, to provide police certificates from their country of origin. And if they're done in a different language, they need to be translated to English or French. Um, so it's best to have that at the beginning because uh, right now we've had uh, experiences where clients seem to have sent everything complete and IRCC will reject and, re and return applications saying like, oh, you're missing this form, please send everything back again and we'll put you in again in the queue. Uh, right now, as of October, there's a permanent residence application portal, um, which is, it's relatively easy to use. Um, it's a lot more convenient, especially when it comes to providing information about lock-in dates if someone's approaching 22 years of age. Um, it's just a bit unwieldy. And so far the experience that we had is sometimes they've been providing rapid responses and, uh, and asking for uh, providing an application form. Um, I'm gonna ask him the Q&A later on today, but uh, okay, sorry. Uh, there's a benefit to that, but there's also, uh, if you don't feel comfortable, you can still send this by paper. You just have to make sure that you send it to the correct place and keep track of everything through certified mail or for FedEx. Um, again, this portal was launched in October. It's relatively easy to use. It'll still ask for the, amount, the same amount of information and it does ask for one additional form that's not present in the normal paper application, which is the supplementary travel information. That just asks um, if the sponsored person or any of the dependents have traveled in the last 10 years and keep track of it. But it, uh, our experience so far with uh, both my coworkers and clients is that it's been a pretty efficient way of submitting everything. And if the client or yourself are comfortable handling email and keeping track of these things, it's a very powerful tool. So if you ever get the chance to, to use it and you can use it comfortably, I would suggest using it. Uh, when it comes to sponsoring grandparents and parents, as we said before, it's sort of a lottery system and there are more, much more strict financial requirements. We haven't seen what the requirements will be for 2022 
but the financial requirements uh, are determined by the household, how it would be in Canada here. So it's not just the two people that you're uh, supporting. You have to also factor in anyone in this household here in Canada. So for example, if I want to sponsor my two parents and I live with uh, my spouse and a dependent child, uh, the category wouldn't be two people. It would be a category of, of total of five people in total. So I would have to make sure that my income matches this, um, my family income matches these amounts. And that's one of the biggest issues because I know a lot of us come from precarious migrant situations where we had to have very difficult uh, jobs because we haven't uh, had certification with our programs, say if you're engineers, doctors, or nurses. And this is one of the big barriers that we face, especially as an immigrant community here in Canada. But you, you have to make sure you meet this requirement first, even before considering uh, sponsoring your parents. Um, normally, uh, from what I understand, they release this data at the end of uh, near fall each year. And you just have to be very, uh, very vigilant to make sure that you meet the lottery application times on time. And this is normally proved through your uh, um, taxes notice of assessment, where it has very clear um, information on how much money you've earned per year. I'm going to take a brief five minute break and I'm gonna take advantage and start answering uh, a couple questions in the Q&A, okay? Um, someone who's anonymous said, can the father sponsor his dependent children without sponsor his spouse? And as they are separate, they don't have proof of separated as they were doing. Okay, yes, you can sponsor your dependent children without sponsoring your former spouse. Um, the key issues here would be de demonstrating that they are your children in your dependent children. And eventually when they get approved for the sponsorship, um, sorry, I'm just answering that live. Um, when, they, when they get approved, they will need the authorization from the other parent to come into Canada. So depending on how your relationship is with your former spouse, uh, you have to be very careful with that because they will, children will need authorization to, uh, leave their country and enter Canada. But yes, you can do that. Um, Sieda has a, a question where, can we show that the sponsor family member uh, has finances to support themselves? It, it doesn't count it that, oh, sorry. It doesn't count because that would be more effective to demonstrate that they have their own resources to come as visitors. Uh, a sponsorship application is you, uh, the sponsor, demonstrating to the government of Canada and our Immigration Canada that you have the resources to take care of your uh, sponsorees' uh, needs here in Canada. Well, it could alleviate it to a certain degree where they don't need to prove, but it, ultimately the onus is on you, the sponsor, to show that you can do this. And I know I talk a lot about uh, the financial resources, but depending on the sponsor, uh, on the sponsor, uh, the sponsor member's age. Um, it doesn't, it's not that, it's not that strict. Um, Elisa is asking, what about parents? So parents, again, they may have their own resources uh, because they might be well established, but that only proves that they come as visitors. Again, um, with parents, there are very strict requirements that the sponsors, so, so you and your spouse have the necessary income over the last three years. Uh, to prove to prove to the Canadian government that they can be that you can sponsor your parents. So it's it, I know it's a bit counterintuitive, but you have to demonstrate to the government of Canada that you can take care of them. Um, I think uh, both Sarogini and Anonymous and Cindy uh, are asking the same question. From what I understand, and I can do this right now. But we'll do this. Sorry, one second. I normally check here. <laughs> Sorry. Anytime you have any questions about how the average is, I always go to application processing times at the CIC. And, uh, sorry, family sponsorship, parents or grandparents, and the processing time is normally significant amount of time right now, especially because we're still dealing with COVID and it's almost three years now. 
So that's why we have to be very careful when we submit data to uh, applications to uh, Immigration Canada. I think I answered both as well. Uh, sorry. Okay, I answered that. Um, is that the amount of two people, 32,000? No. So if you have a spouse here, it's it, the, the amount of people counts the, the people being sponsored and the people residing in your household. So if you have a spouse, you already have two people in your household. And if you're sponsoring your both your parents, it would bump up the number to four. So it's a total household if your parents were to be here. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick um, five minute break um, and then we'll move forward, okay? Thank you, I'll be right back. And then we'll do another quest, uh, another uh, Q&A quest session at the end. Okay, welcome back. Uh, I'll be answering questions at the end of the session as well. I know we've accumulated quite a bit, both in the Q&A and the chat. Um, so we'll get started on that as well, okay? Because we still have a way to go. <laughs> Okay, so when people apply to come um, to come to um, Canada, and they, it's very important the forms to declare all your family members. Uh, it's it's very important because, uh, say for example, if someone coming as a visitor, or uh, for some reason you don't uh, say you got into a fight with one of your children and you don't declare them at that. So right now there's a there's still a, there was a pilot program to help reunite family members with undeclared family members because sometimes like what had happened in the past is for fear of a medical condition uh, rendering someone inadmissible, people would have excluded their family members because of that. Uh, the the program was relatively successful, but you had to had a very good reason to remove your family members from that. So as I said before, when it comes to say for example, if you have a family member who may have a criminal record back home, but you wanna try to sponsor them and also other family members, what we suggest in this case is to do separate applications. Um, that way, if someone's criminal record does affect the application, only one person um, is sort of left dealing with that and not the entire family is left in limbo because dealing with a criminal uh, background, uh, you have to reach a full pardon, not only from your country of origin, but here as well and it could take decades, unfortunately. So just be very, very aware of that. Uh, when it comes to sponsorships, um, it's how, it's not so much how long it takes to do, to receive a sponsorship, is how long the sponsor is responsible for the person they are sponsoring. So if you're sponsoring your spouse, uh, the average length of a, of a sponsorship process is three years uh, with the exception of Quebec, which I'm not sure about the rules. With dependent children under 22 years of age, it's 10 years or until they're 25, whichever comes first. And if you're sponsoring a dependent child who is about to turn 22 within the lock-in period and you submit the application before that, you're responsible with them for three years. And parents and grandparents, it's roughly 20 years. And that's why it's very important to have that financial information. Other relatives, it's more depending on like uh, adopted nieces or children, it can take an average up to 10 years. When it comes to the sponsorship fees, um, when we had more capacity here at the JFCJ and once we have a bit more capacity, we normally do the applications for free. There is another organization called the Mennonite New Life Center that does applications for free as well. However, you still have to pay immigration uh, their due. So the sort of breakdown for each application fee is, for example, for a, for a spouse, partner, um, parent, or grandparent, uh, it's roughly the sponsorship fee, which is $75, the processing fee, which is $450, and the right of permanent residency, residency. You can pay this in two sort of installments but you at least have to pay for $550 for the applications of the start being processed. If everything works out okay, 
they'll have to pay. Uh, they'll see, they'll go like, oh, Edgar, you've been approved as a sponsorship. We're still missing your sponsorees, a right of permanent residency. Please make a, a payment to the IRCC um, via the website for $500. Um, for children, it's only $150 each. So as an organization, we, when it comes especially to family reunification and granting the rights and uh, privileges to children in the, abroad, we really do encourage you to encourage, uh, include as many dependent children as you can. Um, as when it comes to the financial requirements of children, uh, it's not as strict as the grandparents or the parents one. Um, when it really comes down to it, all they really ask is that you're not receiving Ontario Works and that you've been working a job. It's only when your own dependent children have dependents of their own that it becomes a lot more financially stricter. Uh, the processing time for a spouse uh, or partner is roughly 12 months. For dependent children, it varies for country. Uh, some of us come from countries where there's a Canadian consulate there and we're, or we're not stuck in the middle of a civil war. So it's easier to access, say, biometrics, a panel physician to conduct uh, the biometrics or the medical exam. So it varies from country to country. Um, According to the annual report of Parliament, um, Immigration Canada does have big plans to uh, increase the amount of uh, sponsorship um, program um, sponsorship applications in Canada. Um, right now, according to the official figures and the annual report of last year to Parliament, we're hoping to see roughly eighty thousand uh, spouses, partners, and children, and twenty five thousand um, total family uh, twenty grandparents and parents. So as you can see, like the parents and grandparents is a, it's less than half. So it, if you get approved, if you're lucky enough to be in a situation where you can afford to uh, support your parents or grandparents, you still have to be lucky enough to win the lottery system there. And the next session is a lot more serious, but I also, I we take the situation very seriously because unfortunately all of the cases that we see in the office are, people who are dealing with sponsorship breakdown because things fall apart or more seriously when there's domestic abuse. So we always include this application, this presentation here to make sure people know their rights as someone being sponsored and also your responsibilities as someone who is sponsoring. Um, a sponsorship breakdown in its technicality is when a sponsor or co-signer is no longer able to or refuses to, to provide the basic requirements as agreed upon the sponsorship undertaken agreement, which is covering their basic needs um, and, and food, housing, and uh, up to a DV sort of um, expenditures of like making sure that they're all right. And the sponsored family member is in order to survive here in Canada, needs to apply for uh, social assistance, Ontario Works and ODSP. Um, it, it's not considered a sponsorship breakdown if the sponsored family member has secured their means. I know there was a question here about uh, SIN numbers and once you obtain your permanent residence. Once you obtain your permanent residence, you have your permanent SIN number, so you can work. Um, and if you become financially independent, it's not a sponsorship breakdown because you are taking care of your own needs yourself. So, because you won't be required to apply for OW in order to survive. Um, before seeking social assistance as a sponsored person, just it, it's, I know the, the, the description here says that you have to reach out to your sponsor to talk about saying like, look, uh, we had an agreement about my basic needs. Um, I need food or, or housing, but we also have to see this through the lens of domestic violence. So if the sponsored person here is suffering domestic violence, which can be taking multiple forms, um, asking someone for permission to apply for Ontario Works is effectively putting them in danger. So if there's already a situation of domestic violence, we really encourage people who are being sponsored to just apply immediately for Ontario Works and protect their own needs and safety first, okay? Um, but we also have to be careful because the, the abuser can accuse the person seeking Ontario Works that they're committing fraud. Uh, in that case, it's important for the sponsored person to keep track of how they're being supported 
and if they're forced to go beyond to to seek areas or beyond their sponsor make sure that they try to assist food banks or other areas but be very careful if you're being sponsored and your needs are not being met okay so again if there's a sponsorship breakdown because of domestic abuse do what you need to to survive do not ask for permission from your abuser um seeking if you find yourself in a sponsorship breakdown and your needs are not being met you can call ow um, but you will have to go through the normal sort of assessment period with them so you'll be determined like oh what was your income before what is your housing situation what are your family needs if you have dependent children of yourself and OW or ODSP, depending on your medical or, or mental health condition, will assess and determine how much assistance you can get. Um, if the sponsor is providing some partial support, but not enough, uh, it'll be deducted from this original amount. Unfortunately, with the provincial government, ODSP and OW is not enough to survive in Canada. It's very hard to survive in Canada without uh, social assistance. So when it comes to um, what your rights are as someone being sponsored, um, if you're already a sponsored person and you already receive your, your, your permanent resident card, if there's a sponsorship breakdown, that will not be affected, okay? Um, it's only affected if you render yourself invisible by committing a, obtaining a criminal record here. Um, all the rights you have as a permanent residence are still valid. Um, if there's a financial need, so for example, say I was sponsored by my spouse, things fell apart, but because I obtained a work permit and my own permanent residence application, my PR uh, card, I can work for myself. Um, but say I got laid off by my job, I can still apply for uh, social assistance. And if this falls within that sponsorship period of five years, seven years, uh, my my sponsor, is, my sponsor is still responsible for that. And I really wanna emphasize this. If you're being sponsored at the moment or considering that you have every right and we really encourage it to not stay in a situation of domestic violence. Um, I understand some of us may be without status and are, and if someone's an abuser has status, they will use that to leverage that. But please know that you have the right to call the police and there are other options. So again, um, well, I just wanna say that once you start a sponsorship, both as a sponsor and a sponsored person, it's an unconditional agreement that you, you're basically undertaking with the Canadian government that um, you're responsible for someone during the sponsorship period. Um, for example, um, if uh, we've had cases where someone sponsors someone else and the moment they got their PR card, they decided to leave. Uh, as I said before, once you obtain that permanent residence, nothing can, very few things can take away that permanent residence. And if you sponsored someone and they decide to leave, it's their own right. So please be aware that also you're sponsoring someone. If you, through your life circumstances, uh, you find yourself in a situation of bankruptcy. Um, you can declare bankruptcy, and you and your and your uh, sponsored person can go for Ontario Works, but you will receive a lifelong ban from sponsoring someone. Strangely enough, it's not a situation of domestic violence, but it's actually just uh, paying the money to the Canadian government that causes a lifelong ban. Um, what is considered a sponsorship default is um, if your sponsored person. Uh, during the period, start receiving Ontario work. And what happens then is that you'll get a notification normally through Ontario Works or the Canadian Revenue uh, Agency that you owe a certain money to the CRA and that you can't sponsor anyone else until that is done. So the same criteria appears for the agency applications is um, when you're applying for a humanitarian and compassionate grants application, you can't be in Ontario Works or if you owe anything to anyone else, you have to get that done, but that doesn't really ap apply to this conversation. Um, so since October 2004, uh, there's been a, a ministerial decree that 
uh, people who are who have sponsored someone in the past and they've gone on OW during that sponsorship period, you are responsible for that amount. So um, it's making sure that your sponsored person has all the needs that they have in order to establish themselves here. But the OW and ODSV will keep a very fierce track for that. And it's once they have that in their system, the only way out is by paying that money eventually or agreeing to a payment plan. Um, um, normally what happens is uh, when someone starts reaching out for Ontario Works, you'll receive a notification that your sponsored family member um, is reaching out for Ontario Works and, uh, and you'll be informed of the amount that they'll start accruing and that you're responsible for that. So uh, if there's no payment on your behalf for that, uh, um, the Ontario government does can take litigation steps against you. So please be aware of that, that you're really financially responsible until the sponsorship period is over. Um, again, what happens to the sponsor, it's not really, it's not really, you can't go to jail for failing a sponsorship. It's just that uh, your, your credit will be negatively affected. Um, you won't be able to apply for another sponsorship for another another family member until the debt is paid. Um, again, um, it's it, what's really troubling is that, according to the IRCC, what really bans you is more financial instead of a aggressive or dangerous behavior towards your partners or your dependents. But it's it doesn't really affect them. What you can do if you're a victim of domestic violence is. You can call the police, put a police report, and and get that protection that you need. Okay, your rights of the sponsor. Uh, regardless of what happens with uh, a sponsorship application, your status as a permanent resident or citizen is unaffected. Um, all the rights you have as a citizen or a permanent resident are unaffected as well. It's mostly financial for what you're responsible for. So. If everything works out okay, you'll be able to sponsor another family member, but you have to make sure that the sponsor period is finished, that you don't have any outstanding debts to OW. And this is the key one when it comes to like doing an application is that both for children and, and, and spouses, they're not asking for crazy amounts of money and, and income, but they do ask you to be not relying on social assistance for 12 months before submitting the application. So if I plan to submit that today, I had to make sure that I had been working since May of last year. And sometimes it'll be worth saying like, okay, we'll start working on the application, but we got to secure a job for the sponsor first. Just take the time to make sure this doesn't bounce back to you. A sponsorship breakdown can be resolved. Um, again, but it depends on the situation the cause of breakdown. If it's just financial needs and a disagreement, both sponsor and sponsor and sponsored person can make an agreement like, okay, don't go on Ontario Works, but I'll give you a living stipend for a certain amount of time. Um, however, if it's a situation of domestic violence or abuse, don't compromise with your abuser. Call OW um, and make sure that your needs and safety are being addressed immediately. And we're going back to the situation of abuse. And I feel that this is very important, especially for the sponsored person because of the power dynamics of this application. Um, abuse is not only physical aggression, it's also neglect. Uh, it can also be financial abuse where someone has complete control over someone's finances. It can be emotional. It can even be something as controlling behavior where you limit access or, to people's cell phones so they can't reach out to anyone. So, and it's always cyclical. And the idea is to always create fear and control into the victim. So I, I say this not because um, I believe everyone, every sponsor is an abuser. It's just because it's too frequent that we have people being sponsored who are left sort of at the mercy of their sponsor because they don't know, because the psycho violence is very complicated and it, it can happen to anyone. Um, Again, you don't have to stay in your abusive relationship. 
it, it'll change the way your status is being processed. Um, just know that the delicate period is while the application is being processed. If you've already obtained your permanent resident card, your immigration status is pretty solid. It's very difficult for it to be removed. How the delicate period is between submitting an application and waiting for that PR card. Unfortunately, we have cases in the cast where it almost seems that they were a couple of days away from obtaining that PR card and then the sponsorship removed it in order to exert control over them. But there are options. If that's the case, if you find yourself in the situation, always remember you can call 911 and, and seek protection. And if you want to sort of see your options towards regularizing your status because of this, I would suggest that you give us a call and we can provide orientation in that case. Um, neglect is another form of abuse, um, especially when it comes to dependent children. Um, if there's someone under 16, children's aid will intervene and they will make sure that the child is being taken care of. Um, if there's a sexual offense against a minor, they won't be eligible to apply to sponsor anyone, even if the sponsorship debt has been paid off. So just make sure that both as a dependent and a spouse who's being sponsored, you know your rights. And when it comes to verifying and reporting this, it's I understand that a lot of people have a lot of very valid fears about reaching the police, but there are other people who can help you out. It can be your lawyer if you're already a refugee claimant, your doctor, your teacher, social workers as well, members of the clergy. Every one of these people who can help you sort of create a record of what's happening for you and that can be used later on for another type of application to regularize your status. There are other methods to seek out help. Again, if you're in immediate danger, call 911. Um, I know I, I see that uh, because we took this from the Government of Canada Information Center. Uh, that number, if you call the 1-888-242-2100, please be advised that it'll take a significant amount of time uh, to get connected with an agent. You just have to be stubborn and stay on the line, okay? But they'll help you navigate and know the status of your application. So in case there's misinformation with your uh, sponsor, you can see like, look, uh, this is my full name. I have my UCI number, my date of birth. I just wanna see in what status my application is. And that way you are better informed of what your immigration status is while you're dealing with the situation. 201 is also excellent to connect to other service agencies. Uh, once you're ready to leave off a, a, a situation of domestic violence, we also connect to, recommend connecting to women's shelter or kids help phone if you're under age 16. So um, we always encourage people not to stay in the situation of domestic violence and always look out for their well being first before anything else. And I'm gonna go over a brief section, which is the family reunification and permanent residence application. And this is mostly for uh, people who went through the refugee process here, but weren't able to bring their family members when they started their process. And this is done normally in the PR application. It's very similar in the sense that the proofs it asks you, it asks you for a lot of proof of family connection, passports, birth certificates, and even sort of remittances. Um, so if you're a protected person and say you left your spouse back home with other children, you're allowed to include them immediately in your uh, permanent residence application. Um, and again, it depends on the, the, this, the restrictions here are a lot more strict dependence. You can only reunite with family members who are your spouse by marriage or common law or any children under 22 in the lock and date. So in this case, say if I'm a protected person, say today, but I started my process uh, five years ago. But my son or daughter is, uh, say, 23 right now. The lock-in date would have been safe because they would have been under 22 when I started my refugee claim. So it's always important to have those dates and always important to include them. Um, so you can always include your children. So that's why it's important at the beginning of your refugee claim to include everyone because it's very hard to not include someone if they weren't declared. The processing fee is uh, still uh, 550 for adults and then 150 for each child under 22. And it's still the dependent date because it goes under that lock-in date. So uh, 
Family reunification, it takes time. Unfortunately, uh, there was a recent report that uh, IRCC Canada still has a backlog of 2 million applications. Um, so it'll take time, unfortunately. I am going to leave my sort of email and extension there as well. Uh, and I'm gonna start actually asking, uh, answering questions. So I'm gonna start with the chat and then the Q and A, okay? Okay, uh, someone has a, what if the children are already in Canada and you don't speak with their dad? How do you get them to sign the documents? So if the children are already here as visitors, um, they, in order to get here in the first place, they already had to have had uh, authorization. So um, the, the issue is custody and connecting with the children to do the biometrics and the medical exams. So it's not so much that he needs any, uh, you need to sign uh, with him here. It's the issue is getting, getting children out of their country of origin. So if they're already here in Canada, um, all, the only issue will be connecting with them to see, make sure that they have their passports, uh, they're able to do the biometrics and complete the medical exam. Uh, sponsoring the... Uh, if you're, if you're talking about, uh, Linny's asking, what is the chance for sponsoring parents at this moment from the government? Um, it's only very rare. The government of Canada will only rarely intervene in certain uh, humanitarian and international crises. Um, right now, the application process for the lottery system is closed at the moment. It's normally at the end of the year where they're available. Um, so the chance, it's, it's, it's low. Uh, I wouldn't count on it, but it's still worth the try. It's it's a lottery system. Uh, that's all I can tell you, uh, Lenny. Marion saying is parents are turning sixty five soon. Will they be acceptable? Okay, so uh, if you're turning sixty five soon, you'll have um, the pension benefit. From what I understand, is is something you accumulate over years uh, of working here by paying your taxes, and you determine a certain amount there. Um, what happens is uh, that they'll have access to the old age benefit uh, services, but not a full pension because they would have had, had to work here in order to accumulate that and build that up. Uh, Lena's asking wife, she, um, a convention refugee refused her PR and her family came to Canada as a visitor. What does she do for him to applying to work with in health service? Okay. Um, so, um, Lena, depends on how, sometimes what you'll do is uh, if she already has her PR and she didn't include him in her PR application or he's still waiting for the situation, I, it depends if he, she included him in her PR application. If he just came, if she didn't include him and um, for some reason IRCC didn't ask about that or if this is a marriage afterwards, that uh, after her PR she can apply from within Canada and apply for a work permit, but she has to submit a, a permanent um, a sponsorship application. But please be advised, if she does that, um, he will, if there's a negative decision on the sponsorship application, you can't appeal it, okay? Uh, is there, is there is a, Leila, I'm not sure I've understand your question. There is a drawn, for parents against this person, which means that a person might not be able to bring their there's a limit. Uh, as we said before, the projected amount this year is 25,000 and they probably receive a lot more application and it does open every year, but it, it's it's a lottery system. So if you get rejected this time as a sponsor, you can try again later, but you just still have to meet those financial requirements each year. Uh, Marta, you can't you can't sponsor your uh, sister. Um, they would have to start their own immigration process here. Um, uh, sorry. Does income demonstrated on federal income table? Um, okay, for example, the family income demonstrated is for household. So if it's a family of five and two people are working, you can show two notice of assessment for the two working people. Um, you just have to demonstrate both and say that the sum total of both yeah, meets the requirement. Um, uh, 
Okay, uh, Faith asks, is there a specific amount of funds I should ask, uh, should have to sponsor my biological sin children as a single mom? So when it comes to the direct dependents who are under 22, and say if you have a child who doesn't have their own dependents or spouse because they're 18 or their own children of their own, uh, the only real financial requirement, uh, Faith, is that you do not be on uh, Ontario Works and just working, okay? That's just, that's just the key issue there. Uh, someone's just asking, I was landed immigrant and adopted in my country. I was a landed immigrant and I adopted in my country, my niece, who I've been taking care of since four months. Sent to Senegal, wait one second. Uh, since the application is there, it's stuck. Okay, uh, Beatrice, if that's the case, um, can you call us at info at, um, sorry, at 221 and we can provide a sort of my direct um, guy orientation there, okay? Uh, I don't feel too comfortable talking to this uh, about your private matters here, okay? Um, we're very busy, uh, sorry. You cannot reach them by phone, but they don't answer email. Uh, if it's us, it's just a bit of patience that but we do receive a lot of phone calls. Um, but if it's the IRCC, you have to be stubborn on the phone and you or you either have to submit a web form. The other option is reaching out to your local member of parliament and authorizing them to sort of intervene and ask on your behalf. Uh, Carlene is asking if you're receiving a pension. Yes, a pension is not social assistance. It's something that you work for years on to uh, contribute. So you should be good. So uh, saying of as, as a legal guardian, so ordering CRA, yeah, it sort of does, it depends on why you owe the CRA. If it's for a, a previous OW, uh, a previous sponsorship, it does. Um, and it depends on the sponsorship. If it's your familiar, your parents and grandparents, it could affect that. Um, what is the process to apply for PRs or refugees as extended family members? Sorry, what is the process to apply for a PR as refugees for extended family members of PR in Canada? I got a lot of the questions. Okay. Um, again, um, with Afghanistan, it's the sort of rule is for PR you can only apply for your direct family members up and down. Um, uh, sorry, for PR, it's only down, dependents or spouse. You can't PR, you can't include your PR uh, in your PR application parents. So that's, I know that's a lot of issues with clients from Afghanistan. Um, if they're trying to enter Canada through the US or our, if they have proof that there are family members here with a status, they can go through the safe third country agreement, but that is, uh, the PR application is only spouse and dependents. Uh, I can sponsor my parents in the... Okay, um, it's not that you're sponsoring your parents in the... A humanitarian uh, sponsorship is not what I think you might be talking about. It might be a humanitarian and compassionate grounds application. And um, that's another... It's a very difficult process and it's not as easy as a sponsorship. So. Um, Sorry. So it depends on your income and uh, the luck of the draw with the, with the lottery. William, if you need support with the PR, um, we, we, we can, you can reach out to our info uh, and we'll try to see if we can, when we can provide support for free or the other option is the Mennonite New Life Center, which I'll drop in at the end of the session. Um, what is the income that the sponsor should have? It depends on who they're sponsoring. Um, okay. I think I already entered in their 80s. Sponsor a spouse who is the father of the child. Sorry. To sponsor the spouse who is the father of the child of the sponsor. Yeah, you just have to demonstrate. It, it depends. Like, it, are you still in a relationship with this uh, father? you would have to demonstrate the relationship that it's still real and it's still through communications, through support and not only the birth certificate. So it's not that they're just, if, they, if there's no relationship, it's, it's very difficult. 
the, the lucky drives don't normally open in, in fall, but you have to keep attention to IRCC statements. So please follow them. Uh, Carlene, yeah, you can't, um, you can't sponsor your sister unless she's under 18 and orphaned. It, um, Leila, uh, that medical exam, it depends on what they find out. Uh, if it's not extensive in urgent care, it, it varies. You just have to be very careful. They can still be refused by that, depending on what medical condition they have or we find out. Um, yes, there is. Uh, I would call 416-469-9754. I, my extension is 223, but it, sometimes I get very busy and I can't answer the phone. So the best way is through the reception in 221 so they can keep a log of who called and what pending issue there is. Uh, maternity doesn't uh, count as social assistance and EI as well. It's Ontario Works. But uh, EI, if EI runs out and say in the middle of the application, EI runs out when it starts, and in the middle application, you haven't been able to uh, secure employment. That can cause issues. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Leila, the dependent childhood, dependent disability, they've been, that mostly was through the Harper years where it was much more strict. There's a, it's a lot more lenient now with dependent children. Family here, family sponsorship. Again, you can't, it, it has to be through a group of five and I would recommend talking to the refugee training, sponsorship training program. Uh, Lucena, as soon as you, your PR, you, as you get your confirmation of permanent residence and your uh, PR card, you can apply for your mom, not your sisters. Um, if you obtained your PR uh, through a through a express entry refugee claim to a protected person, you can apply immediately. However, if you've just been sponsored, you have to wait five years. Uh, rehab, a new process convention refugee can apply for work permit for a spouse. Uh, not that I know of, and that they it, it varies on how they get here. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Lenny, it may it, it may affect it. I would not know, and I would probably have to talk would talk to the Mennonite New Life Center. When a migrant worker marries here, and the spouse is sponsored, do the children do the children? No, the birth certificate should be fine. Um, they just have to be trans. The birth certificates have to be translated. Um. Uh, what I would say is um, look for a Google permanent resident application portal. Uh, is a Canadian citizen allowed to do the sponsor sponsorship from someone who is outside of Canada living without status? Yes, you can. But what you can't do is ask for a work permit while they're being processed. But yeah, you can sponsor someone without status here. Yes, we will be recording the seminar. Okay. I think I'm going to go to the Q&A now, just make sure that we have everyone's questions. Uh, Marion asks, if parents are successfully sponsored and turning 565, I already answered about the old uh, age benefit. Um, the guaranteed income supplement, yes, and, old, and uh, old age security, but not the pension itself. Uh, yes, once they accept it and have the PR, they'll have their permanent SIN number and they can work freely in Canada. Uh, okay, uh, that's done. Sorry. I think I already answered about the 80 years old. Uh, how much time do you need to be a permanent resident to sponsor your parents? It depends if you got your uh, sponsorship, uh, permanent resident through a sponsorship, regardless of who you're applying for, you have to wait five years from the moment you get your landing document. Um, how long and, okay, uh, Lina asks, how long and how many times can someone sponsor a spouse after they get divorced? Okay, so if you obtained your permanent residence through a sponsorship and it breaks down, 
afterwards, after you get your PR, you have to wait five years. If you're the person sponsoring someone and it falls apart and you make sure that there's no debt to the to OW, you just have to make sure that you're finalized your divorce and you have all the paperwork for it, okay? But it depends on how you obtain your sponsorship. If you're just a citizen and you just got divorced, it's just making sure that you have the paperwork. I think I already add, uh, answered about the children in Canada. Uh, again, I think I already answered that uh, about the 65. Uh, the biometric, you can, you'll be requested to pay them uh, as IRCC communicates to you through email or letter. You can technically include it at the beginning, but it's not really necessary, but um, it, it's, it will be done while it's being processed for the biometric piece. And a, a reminder, if you're sponsoring more than two people, uh, you don't have to pay more than 170. 170 covers a large family group, so you don't have to pay 85 for each independent family member. Um, do, sorry. Do the sponsored persons become, I think I already answered that. Uh, medical expenses, um, you, you get your OHIP card, but the issue is that medical exam that they'll ask for them before they issue the medical, the, 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 the permanent residence. So we have to, be, you have to be careful of that, but they would have access to OHIP. Um, Yes, there will be PowerPoints of the presentation. Uh, I think I answered it roughly for, uh, okay, is this possible to assist sister? No, um, you can't sponsor your sister, your, her spouse and her three children, unfortunately. Sponsorship only goes up to his parents and down to dependents and uh, spouse. Uh, the sponsorship period varies from application. For a spouse, it's roughly a year. For parents, it's roughly, spouse and dependent children is roughly a year. Parents can take up to three years now. I answered the maternity leave because you paid into that. Uh, um, I My contact information is right here. <laughs> and so is my email. Uh, okay. Is a Canadian citizen allowed to do so? Yeah, I already answered that, you can. Um, I think I said that three years. The it normally starts in fall, but you have to keep an eye out for declarations from IRCC. Um, I'm gonna type something into the chat right now for you to Google. It's called the Refugee Refugee Sponsorship Training Program, especially when it comes to Group of Five and and coordinating efforts for people in Afghanistan. Okay. Yeah, I think I answered that. Um, one of my, okay, yeah, I think some of the questions are already repeated here. Uh, yeah, I answered that before. So the pension is, it's not so much the pension, it's the old age benefits and security program. So for pensions, you have to pay in for them or uh, while you work here. So for the last year, you have to make sure, unfortunately, yeah, it, it can, it's, it's relentless on that. The last three years have to match the required income. Uh, Bijan asks, I applied for my PR last year in July and checked the application is processing. <laughs> Uh, Pijan, depends on the program. Unfortunately, if it's for uh, ref uh, protected person and convention refugees, it's their average is 22 months. Um, and it could take a significant amount of time. Unfortunately, IRCC has not dedicated enough staff or prioritized staffing uh, for, uh, for protected persons and refugee claimants. So I would just suggest yes, keep, keep your uh, addresses updated. Um, and write to your local MP because this is a systemic issue where IRCC has not dedicated and prioritized um, protected prisons. Uh, 
Uh, okay. No, um, Carlene, that would depend, like medical condition is, if it's delicate and you may have to talk to a lawyer because if someone is over 22 and has a medical condition where they're dependent on that, they would have to have had that medical condition before they turn 22. So if that's, a, that's a more particular case. Um, okay. So I would suggest either talking to a lawyer or if you want to give us a call at our for an orientation, we could try to schedule one, okay? Just by to apply for your parents, you have to wait for fall to see if you win that lottery and are authorized to uh, to become a sponsorship for your a sponsor for your parents. If it's just your spouse and dependent children, you can apply at any time. Um, what if you were not sponsored? In, okay, if you were not sponsored and obtained a PR, you can technically sponsor someone the next day. You moment you get your landed document. Letice is asking, I have a son who is 32 year old who is married. If I understood, I cannot sponsor. Uh, your son would have to uh, see what immigration process uh, they would need to get here. It can be, it can vary from, um, depending on their profession, uh, reaching out to Canadian companies uh, with more than 10 employees, their own, um, their own lawyers to do a labor market impact assessment to come under the workers visa program and then applying for express entry. Uh, they can come as students uh, with certified uh, institutions who are authorized to do the postgraduate work permit um, and work for a couple of years in the field after graduating, but uh, it's he would have to have his own process. Okay, Carlene. Yeah, I would talk to an immigration. Um, I'm trying to think who, but... Uh, you know who's also really good, Carlene? Uh, I'm gonna top uh, right here for everyone. It's the Mennonite New Life Center is a, a very good place for also consultations for um, sponsorships, okay? So I'm just gonna put that here in the chat. Okay, I hope this was very informative. Okay, and I wish everyone a great day. Okay, so um, I'm sure my colleague Carolina will put this all online. And if you have any questions, um, I really encourage us to call like reception because we're a bit overwhelmed with calls, but we keep track of who calls and we'll try to reach out when, the moment we can. Okay, have a, have a great day, everyone. Bye.